This episode has been brought to you by our super generous supporters on Patreon. In a previous video about virtual reality, a few friends and I tested out the latest generation of VR headsets to see how close to actual reality they were. And I have to say, I was pretty impressed. Whoa. Oh, wow. Oh, whoa. As awesome as the experience was though, it was isolating. When you wear a virtual reality headset, you are completely cut off from the rest of the world, including the people that might be in the same room as you. In other words, VR is great, but with current technology, there's no practical way to share that experience with anybody, like you could if you were watching a movie or sports or playing a multiplayer console game. Wouldn't it be cool if there was like a whole virtual reality room that you could share with other people, you know, so your friends could actually see and experience what you're seeing? Could such a place actually exist? In Chicago? Five miles from where I live? So this probably looks kind of weird on camera, but to me, it looks like there's this thing right here. There's not. Oh, like it's it's around you. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you gotta you gotta try this because this is pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> um, ah. <laughs> that's me fumbling my way through a 3D representation of molecules in an ionic solution. It's one of the simulations generated by Cave 2, a room-sized virtual reality environment located in the engineering research facility at the University of Illinois Chicago, pictured here during one of Chicago's famous early spring blizzards. So, is the future here yet? Did somebody finally create the holodeck from Star Trek? Let's find out. I can believe these simulations could be this real. This woodland pattern is quite popular, sir. Perhaps because it duplicates Earth so well. The idea of a room that you can just walk into and have it simulate any environment that you want has been a big part of sci-fi and fantasy series for a long time. Except this time, instead of a galactic starship or an underground mutant training facility, there's a real-life holodeck sitting in an engineering building on a college campus. So I, I was visiting this lab in the early 90s when they were first developing the cave. Mm -hmm. And there were some VR games out there, the virtual reality centers were out there where you could shoot really low res pterodactyls and stuff. <laughs> so VR was sort of in the air, but it was kind of... Eh. This is Andy Johnson, associate professor at the Electronic Visualization Lab at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And I stepped into the original cave and walked around this floating head. Mm -hmm. So it was, just, it was just a skull basically sitting in the space. but I. I could walk around it, I could go through it, and it was an experience. You know, it, it was like something you'd see in the movies, mm -hmm. but I was doing it, it was yeah. real. It was, it was technology as magic, mm -hmm. in some sense. And ever since then, I've wanted to say, you know, how, how can we push this? Not just for entertainment, which mm -hmm. is fun, and, you know, and art and museum exhibits and all that stuff, but you know, how can we really push science and understanding and learning through this medium. Mm -hmm. So the Electronic Visualization Lab is now a little over 40 years old. So we're one of the oldest labs working on computer graphics and you know, interaction in the country. The lab was founded in the early 1970s by a group of engineers and visual artists with the goal of designing and developing high performance visualization hardware and other technologies that were just, you know, really far out, man. One of the lab's first early contributions was something called the Sayer Glove, the world's first ever wired data glove and an early precursor to the infamous Nintendo Power Glove. And in 1976, an animator named Larry Cuba teamed up with EVL founder Tom DeFonte to create a 3D animation for a small, low-budget sci-fi film. You might have seen it before. Yep, the freaking Death Star plans that helped Luke defeat the Empire was, at the time, a very sophisticated computer animation created at the Electronic Visualization Laboratory at UIC. That's impossible, even for a computer. But it's not impossible. I used to bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home. So if anybody can create a real-life holodeck, I'm betting that the guys that designed the Death Star can. So where are we standing right now? What is this? So this space here is Cave 2. So back in the early 90s, uh, this lab sort of changed the way virtual reality was done. In the 80s, it was very much about head-mounted displays, much like it is today, though today they're far cheaper and far better. And the way the lab felt was it was a fairly isolating experience to have these, these things on your heads. So it's, you know, virtual reality is a lot of fun. It's, you know, it's really empowering in some ways, but at the same time, you really like to see people's eyes. You really want to get see their expression or know what are they pointing at? What are they looking at in the space? So what the lab did was sort of flip the paradigm around and have it be 
where you're in this shared space where it's the screens, it's the walls mm -hmm. that are active. And it really having, you know, not just a connection with the virtual world, but a really strong connection between people. Since its launch in 2012, Cave 2 has been a space for scientists to meet together, analyze data, and run various VR simulations, such as a recreation of satellite imagery, chemical reactions, and life-size environmental models. And so where we come in is to try to help them mm -hmm. and say, okay, maybe the technology we have, maybe virtual reality is helpful. The first generation of CAVE in the early 90s used flat walls and rear projection to create a responsive 3D environment. Obviously, things have advanced quite a bit since then, so when CAVE 2 was built, they ditched rear projection in favor of current technology. So, in this case, what we're creating is a cylinder of 3D LCD panels. Mm -hmm. So it's 18 columns, uh, four panels per column to give us a little bit of look up and look down. Each column driven by a computer, in a cluster and connected to about 100 megabits of networking to be able to either move data in, move data out, stream visuals, and speakers to give us 20.2 sounds so we can put sounds literally onto one column of the screen. Oh, okay. Oh, here we go. We're moving. Okay. So one of the things we really wanted to have with the cave, what we found yeah. from 20 years of doing this sort of work is that, you know, people like sunglasses. Uh -huh. People are perfectly happy putting sunglasses on <laughs> and that's not a problem. If you give right. people something that is going to muss up their hair mm -hmm. even, suddenly, you know, politicians and bosses and people suddenly start having issues with it. So yeah. the idea was, you know, can we have something where it's exactly the same glass as you wear in the theater uh -huh. if you go see a 3D movie? Sure, yeah. Except yeah. we have these little marker balls on mm -hmm. it. And then what we have around the top of the cave are basically cameras and emitters. So they're sending out infrared light into the space, uh, okay. bouncing off uh, the little marker balls. Yeah. So it's the same as you'd see in Hollywood where they're wearing the suits. Right, yeah, the tracking. To the do motion tracking. Track. Yeah, okay. And so you. that way, as I'm in the space and yeah. moving around, the graphics move for me. I'm going to put these glasses on, and then this world will shift according to where I am. Oh, yeah. That is cool. Now, can you do the uh, can you do the stereo version? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Actually, it takes it takes a minute for my eyes to adjust. So this probably looks kind of weird on camera, but to me, it looks like there's this thing right here. There's not. It's like I feel like I gotta walk under this thing here. <laughs> so cool. This simulation that I'm checking out is a representation of a gold nanoparticle and chemical reactions between various molecules in an ionic solution. I can see how something like this would be a great tool to have for teaching chemistry, but it's also just pretty awesome. It's funny, it's like you're standing there, but then there's like these little yep. molecules floating around you and you're mm -hmm. sometimes walking through them. It's kind of trippy. If you want to fully appreciate what being in this room is like, you really have to be there and wear the glasses. Oh, geez, yeah, yeah, okay. This is very interesting. <laughs> I mean, this is like... <laughs> but putting them on the camera does give a pretty decent approximation. Can you uh, do a camera vision? Maybe just walk around a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. That's one of the other big issues with virtual reality. You know, you can go to all these exotic places. You know, uh -huh. Anywhere in the universe, you can go, you know, size of an atom, size of a galaxy. But it, if you do it with someone who knows what they're talking about, mm -hmm. the experience is, you know, wonderful. Because, you know, you're mm -hmm. back in history, you're mm -hmm. learning about all this stuff. Another simulation we checked out was a recreation of an actual coral reef built from images and data taken by underwater divers. And, and again, what's nice about this is it's life-size. So if yeah. you were oh, swimming yeah. there, this is exactly how big it would be. So you can cool. see Olympus Mons and the earthquake. Oh yeah. And then down to a canyon about as long as the United States. <laughs> ah, there we go. Oh man. And this is all real Mars surface data. This is, this is all real data. The elevation is kicked up a little bit to make it okay. a bit more obvious what some of the uh -huh. features are. Oh yeah. That was where Matt Damon ended up okay. in the movie. Bummer. <laughs> Did fine. <laughs> and this is a representation of the neural connections inside of a human brain. Whoa, okay. This kind of simulation could potentially help doctors in the future monitor how drugs affect certain parts of the patient's brain. So I think it's, you know, sort of applying current technology and trying to push the technology forward based on the needs of other disciplines. You know, it's the astronomers maybe this year that, you know, we're getting all new data 
like we're going to have. It's going to be astounding. Yeah. What do you do with it? How do you look at it? How do you interpret it? And then eventually it sort of comes back around on the consumer side to, you know, products and data sets that people can use in education and in museums or at home and, you know, sort of helps just in general generate interest in science and, you know, understanding the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So overall, Cave 2 was awesome. It was super fun just walking around and the graphics were really responsive to my movements. I could see how it'd be an immensely helpful educational and scientific tool. So what would you guys do with a full-sized virtual reality room like Cave 2? Also, what is a womp rat? And why was Luke bullseyeing them? Was he just flying around Tatooine indiscriminately killing womp rats for sport? And why was this detail casually brushed aside in the movie? Let us know in the comments. As always, this episode was brought to you by our super generous supporters on Patreon. If you want to support the show, head on over to our Patreon page. And if you like this video, please click like and subscribe. We couldn't do it without you guys. Thanks.